she lives this high life she makes you see you know this money this how she's living and how amazing it is what you don't realize is that's your money girls gather around the box gather on the box gather on the box because you know what caught you out three words shame on you those were the words you used every single time one of your victims tried to get their money back or tried to question why you were being abusive to them, you would write their shame on you. She's known to the authorities. She's known to the authorities as having been a con artist in the past. She's known to the authorities as having multiple cases opened against her. In 1998, I first exposed Tracy Morrison as little more than a two-bit hustler. She was trying to act as a movie mogul from Hollywood. Now, 20 years later, after reopening the investigation, I've been stunned to discover that her scams have evolved into quite sophisticated, utterly bizarre and quite frankly, very sinister crimes. I've had a similar conversation with you before, 20 years ago. Except it wasn't nearly at the severity that it is now. Then I just thought you were not well, and I thought that, that was a, there was this extreme need for validation and to, to impress people and to, to be loved and admired. It was that a long time ago, that's true. No more. Now it is just a big, fat con. On Saturday, April the 14th, 2018, I had accompanied several of Morrison's alleged victims to lay charges of fraud against her at Santon Police Station. That same afternoon, she was finally arrested. On Monday, April the 16th, she appeared in court, but her case was thrown out because it was deemed a civil matter as opposed to a criminal case, and Morrison was released. I approached Chad Thomas of IRS Investigations, who has partnered with Special Assignment to expose Morrison, to try and understand why she had been let off the hook yet again, despite the many charges against her. What concerns me is that when she was taken to court, she was taken to court on one particular case. The cases should have been combined. The magistrate should have been allowed the opportunity to know that this individual has been charged multiple times and that there were currently multiple cases against that particular individual. If the magistrate knew that there were other cases with a similar modus operandi, the outcome would have been very different in my opinion. In fact, since May 2018, dating as far back to 1987, there were multiple charges of fraud laid against Morrison Multiple cases have been opened by different people from different communities, different standings in life, etc., um, where, where different frauds have been perpetrated against them, but the, the common denominator is one particular individual. And these cases are all getting opened within a specific cluster. Then this has to be investigated because one has to ask a very reasonable question. Why would all these different people from different backgrounds that don't know one another all be opening cases against one particular individual? Morrison's alleged victims had been determined not to let her off the hook. That much was evident when one of her landlords that she had been scamming had confronted her the week before her arrest. So things are going to happen this week. They are going to have very severe and long-term repercussions for you and a huge amount turns on how you conduct yourself in this regard so you will have the sheriff back here you'll have the police back here and this time they'll come with a warrant for your arrest and the game is up with you it's up after her arrest the landlord, who had also laid charges of fraud against her, changed the locks of the townhouse where she had defaulted on the rent for months and had her assets seized by the sheriff of the court. 
For once it seemed that Morrison had nowhere to hide, but that didn't mean she would stop perpetrating the crimes she had allegedly been committing for over 20 years. These included impersonating an FBI officer, but we'll get to that one later. Defrauding people by coercing them to invest in bogus businesses. Pretending to own upmarket homes and subletting them as house shares, keeping the rental for herself and withholding refunds of deposits, thereby defrauding both her landlords and housemates. Failing to pay staff and contractors despite undertaking to do so. There seemed to be no way of preventing her from merely continuing with business as usual. Until a week after her release from jail, we received a message from a young woman and a photograph bearing a remarkable resemblance to Morrison. The sender was Chantal Calder, a single mother who had recently moved from KwaZulu-Natal to Johannesburg to make a new start. You know, coming to a new town, you don't know anyone. I don't have friends here to speak that are close and I also don't like being a burden on other people. Chantal had advertised for a job on Gumtree. Morrison responded. She phoned me and she's like, Hi oh, Chantal, can you please send me your CV? I know it sounds a bit weird over WhatsApp. She said, you know what, before we waste each other's time, what salary are you looking for? By that time I had sent her my CV. She had sent me the website, Purple Chair Interiors. It looked legit. You know, I went through the stuff. Um, you know, I didn't have any reservations about going for the interview. The Purple Chair website promoting Morris's so-called interior design business was comprised of stock art images. Her company, to all intents and purposes, was a fake. She used her so-called businesses to allegedly scam scores of victims out of tens, even hundreds of thousands of rands. But then Morrison called her to say she would be moving out of the townhouse in mid-April and she required Chantal's help in packing her boxes. What she basically said to me was she hated the townhouse and what she had fired all her staff for drinking it on work time, which was we obviously know now as a load of rubbish. She said to me, let me just do my move and then we will start, once the office is up and running, then we will start doing things, but otherwise it's going to be very slow. So your salary will increase. She had asked Chantal to work for her on Saturday, April the 14th. She phoned me and said to me, Chantal, listen here, um, don't worry, you're off the hook for today because I'm going to Philandsburg because there's a huge hotel there, which we are going to start doing their rooms and that if we get the contract and the guy wants to go through the brief. Um, once we get the brief, you are going to be taking over that contract and you are going to be going to Philandsburg to do all the work. Do you know ultimately where she was that weekend? I know now, but I didn't know then. Where was she? Well, she had actually been arrested. entertainment news tune into trends every saturday from 12 to 1. everyone wants a dignified funeral that is what a clientele funeral plan can give you lasting dignity i just want my family to be there all relaxed not worrying about paying for anything knowing that clientele covered everything i would like a dignified funeral and the rest should be invested for my children's future Clientel funeral plans pay out in 24 hours. We will even send 200 rand airtime. You can cover up to 13 people on one plan. Plans include grocery, unveiling, and transport benefit. Plus, you can get all your premiums back. I told my family, 
I don't want a fancy funeral. They must come there for a cook sister and a sandwich, and then they must use the rest of the money for their future. I will never stop paying my monthly premium. To me, paying my monthly premium is as important as buying groceries. SMS LIFE to 31043 and we'll call you back. After spending the weekend behind bars from April the 14th to the 16th, Morrison returned to the townhouse where she still allegedly owed the landlord 66,000 rand and where we had confronted her about her scams the week before. There she discovered locked doors, her possessions seized and her pets transferred to the SBCA for safekeeping. Well, she phoned me and she says to me, Chantal, listen, forget it. Don't come to the townhouse anymore. Um, my husband's kicked me out. Running low on options, she had checked into an upmarket hotel in Santon. Walk in there and she's sitting in a towel. Just like, okay. <laughs> Day three of this job and I'm seeing my boss half naked. Really? <laughs> like, I want to see this. And then she said to me, you know what? My ex-husband, I got him in to look after my animals because the animals know him. He stayed the weekend and when I got home this morning, he was standing there, Papa, you no longer live here. He wouldn't let her take anything. She only had the clothes that she had on. Did she say what line of work her ex-husband was in? She said that he was the ex-station commander of Sandton Police and that he had actually started his own business investigating people. It so happens that Morrison's ex-husband was not the former station commander of Santon Police. In fact, she was never married to a station commander. But this forms yet another bizarre twist in subsequent episodes. She sat down with me and she said to me, you know what, there's big shit coming, <laughs> you know. And I need to know that you, one, you are trustworthy, Two, that you're going to have my back. And three, you're not going to discuss my business. So what exactly was the business? Because she had no clothes, I don't want to sit with my boss naked. So, and I'm a nice person. So I bought her a pair of pants, a shirt, a jersey, because it was very cold. Her duties also included driving Morrison around at her own expense to look at houses to rent and sublet. Just say, Chantal, we need to find a new house. I don't have a credit history because I'm American. I don't want my ex-husband knowing how much money I've got. So I've got everything tied up in trusts. And in fact, although she also has American citizenship, as her identity document confirms, Morrison is a born and bred South African. <laughs> it's like this whole drama that's unfolding is like Jerry Springer. Inevitably, the name Gina Latham one of Morrison's most commonly used aliases peppered the conversations. Gina was her daughter. She was staying with her account, well, spending time with her accountant in Cape Town, learning the ropes so she could come back up to Joburg and take over the financial part of the company, as far as I'm aware. Where do you get these aliases from? Um, Gina Latham? Gina Latham is a friend of mine. I thought you said she was your she, daughter. No, she's my friend's daughter, who I've basically taken under my wing. Where does Gina live? Cape Town. Where in Cape Town? I have never been to Cape Town. Uh, but you should know where she lives in Cape Town, Shelley. Uh, but I'll get you the information. I'll get it from her mum. Where, where does her mum live? Where does her mum live? <laughs> I'm not sure what the name of the suburb is. Oh, okay. Um, I think you're getting tripped up now. Morrison also attempted to get Chantal to invest in her bogus business and started saying to me, I'm so bummed that you don't have money of your own because I've got this job that I've got. It's almost a million rands worth of work. You could be in charge of it, but you have to put money in because if you put money in and you work hard, I know that we're gonna get a investment back. Since we broadcast the first episode of To Catch a Constar in July this year, we have been inundated with information from additional victims of Morrison's alleged scams and they've provided further proof of a marathon crime spree that she allegedly conducted for probably well over a decade. For example, 
we've got tenancy agreements where she poses as a landlord of a property that she clearly doesn't own and also goes by the now infamous alias Gina Latham. Then there are the letters of appointment to her bogus businesses where she employed young, impressionable, mainly women and promised them handsome salaries, good commissions to supposedly market her business, be a sales consultant and get clients for her interior design company, a company which to all intents and purposes did not exist. One of Morrison's former employees has revealed how she allegedly conned staff and clients alike. We've disguised her voice for her own protection. And so I helped her hire some people. Before we did any of these interviews, she says, you know what, and I'm so sorry to ask you this, but I think just just let them know that you've been working with me for years. Mm. Because if, if it's that you've just been hired by me, maybe they'll, you know, not not respect you or stuff like that. So I was like, that's a bit weird, but okay. <laughs> she only hired pretty girls. And she hired all of these girls to go and make sales yeah. showing these photos which i don't think were actual actually her work and and to basically make sales and then she would never deliver oh. and these people would be paying deposits um to have their house designed and obviously i mean she wasn't an interior decorator and even a weekend behind bars did not deter morrison from continuing her scams in addition to having an uncanny ability to scam her victims Morrison also has an uncanny ability to incriminate herself. For example, during the last episode, we checked up to see whether she was back to her old tricks. She was operating another website advertising a bogus business. We phoned her and verified that it was indeed Morrison. My name is Tracy. I used to be the owner, but she's the lady that's taken over. But then she called us back using the very number that she used to operate as her alias, Gina Latham. She quickly realized the error of her ways and blocked us. But by then it was too late because we had a screenshot of the telephone number. And as you can see, under the number, clearly written, is the name Gina. By then, Chantal had put the pieces together and realized that she too was a victim. And then I realized to myself, okay, I'm not going to see my salary. But she doesn't know that I know what I know. <laughs> so let me see how much information I can actually gather. And that's when I started working with you. And I just thought to myself, you know what? If I can do one more day with her, just one more, just to try and see where she would go, how we could catch her. Chantal also conducted her own research. I just started reading all these news clippings and Facebook messages and all these people saying, thank goodness she's been arrested, thank goodness this, 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 this and that. Chantal provided us with the contact details of further potential victims who we speedily notified about Morrison's history of fraud. One of them was another landlord who had already signed a tenant lease with Morrison. The part where it affected me very, very badly is when we went to go and look at this house of Anya and Tracy sat there with a grin on her face and said, you know what, you know how a thief works, they're always the most suspicious and I couldn't help but sitting there thinking, yes, you really do know how that works, don't you? Especially when she tried to rip off Anya, I just realized it. she's got no morals, she's got no care, she just doesn't Give a damn. Thanks to Chantal, we were able to warn the prospective landlady and she rapidly cancelled the lease. And at the end of April, we alerted the hotel where Morrison had been staying about her deceit. The hotel subsequently evicted her for not paying her hotel bills and has since laid charges against her. But Chantal's experience with Morrison had taken its financial and emotional toll. My whole life is falling apart. Um, I can't pay my children's school fees. Um, I'm relying on my mother-in-law to, and my mom to, who are pensioners, to help me with money. I'm not going to let her keep me quiet 
And if she can do this to me, she can do it to everybody. What about these poor girls or whoever she rips off who have got nothing, nothing. Don't be afraid to open yourself up to new experiences. Exchange and share ideas and crafts. I want to move on from the idea of the African as an exotic person who dances nicely and makes good artwork. We must be at the cutting edge of everything possible as we once were. Many ancient African kingdoms had scientific and mathematical knowledge that still baffles experts today. When I look at Africa, I see hope, I see trust, bright colors, warm smiles, variety and difference. In the end, it's not just about wanting to know what the African look is or if we have a common African identity. In the months following Morrison's arrest and release in April, she continued to use Santon as her housing location and hunting ground. It seemed that despite the many charges that had already been laid against her, she was unwilling to relocate to another suburb. And if you survey the more than half a dozen homes that she occupied in the last few years, a distinct pattern emerges. She always chooses lavish residences that are very close to Santon Police Station. The residences have high walls, high security, they're part of gated communities where there are booms at the entrance and the end of the road is normally blocked off, so access is normally restricted. One of her former housemates, who had also allegedly been scammed out of thousands after investing in her bogus businesses, made an affidavit accusing Morrison of stealing his identity, opening a telecom account with it at this address in Gary Avenue and raking up a bill of thousands. One of Morrison's former employees provided us with this invoice taken from Morrison's computer. What she was doing with the telecom invoice addressed to him still needs to be investigated. Ideally what should be happening is if you believe you've been prejudiced financially, somebody's misrepresented facts, that means you've been defrauded, you go to the police station and you make what's called your A1, it's your statement. You make your statement, the police should register a case, they should send you the CAS number. That docket should go to the detectives, where the detective branch commander should give instructions to an investigating officer what to look for to try to prove a prima facie case. But the charges laid by several of Morrison's victims have allegedly been ignored or dismissed at station level. A case in point is that of three handymen, Innocent Siniwa, Colin Kapfumo and Samuel Langer, who had also performed services for Morrison at the house in Gary Avenue and who she had failed to pay. When I met them and heard their plight, it reinforced the fact that for Morrison, rich, poor, white, black, everyone was fair game. She kept on telling me I'll give you, uh, the clients didn't pay, we were waiting for the clients to pay. Then uh, it went on for a week, it went on for a month, it went on for two months. I went there, they gave me the letter of demand. I took it to the police. Then we uh, went to her house. She signed the form that she was going to pay me in 14 days. I had to go back to the police. Then they referred me to run back court. I took that uh, letter of demand to run back court. They gave me the summons to take to the sheriff. I went to the sheriff in Midrand. Then the sheriff um, went to look for Tracy. She, went, she was nowhere to be found. It cost Innocent time and money to launch a civil lawsuit against Morrison. So I was paying for everything, fuel, and for, by the sheriff, we have to pay 300 rand for the sheriff to do his work. You don't necessarily have a commercial crime specialist at every single police station. So the person that you take in the, the, the case to, who's standing behind the charge off his desk, doesn't necessarily understand the elements of the fraud. But the problem is you go there, 
you keep on going doing the same thing every day. Most of the people they end up leaving the case, just leave it like that, yeah. I accompanied the complainants to Santon Police Station where the head of the fraud unit, Lieutenant Colonel Sikweni, agreed to meet us. He told us that Morrison was due to appear in the Randburg Small Claims Court on Thursday, the 14th of June, that the complainants should make affidavits at the court and present them to Santon Police Station to combine with the existing charges against Morrison so that she would be charged criminally. We did this and returned to the station. Hey guys, I told you tomorrow, ne? I told you that I only entered up, but I will attend to you tomorrow. Now I'm busy with that inspection. I've already WhatsApp Mulope, everything will be sorted. Okay. I've already done everything. We just want to get his telephone number so that we can... Uh, but when I called Constable Mulope, he denied having spoken to Colonel Sikweni. The following day, a Thursday, I went to Randburg Court, expecting Morrison to appear. Not only did she not appear, but the small claims court does not operate on a Thursday. As for the handymen, who had already spent hundreds of rands trying to pursue charges, well, their cases were simply ignored. And if those dockets are not being investigated, it means that there could be corruption. Those case numbers should be given to IPUD, and IPUD should come and look at why those cases weren't investigated. Because if nothing's happening at station level, there's a problem at station level, and it has to be escalated. It was only after I had sent letters of complaint to Santon Police Station, the Senior Public Prosecutor, the Hawks and IPUD, that Santon Police finally took action. On July the 24th, Morrison was rearrested on a single charge of fraud laid by the hotel where she had been staying after her release in April, and she will appear in court during September. Between her release on April the 16th and her recent arrest on July the 24th, she had allegedly scammed at least four more victims. Now we might never be able to fully dredge the marshlands of Morrison's misdeeds, but thanks to the integrity and courage of her victims, slowly but surely, the tide is turning against her.